All right, well, welcome, everybody. Um, the class is titled Understanding the Bible, but I thought I would make it a little more personal, and so I titled it Understanding Your Bible. And uh, so we want to have a deep intimacy with God's Word, and uh, I know some of you came here tonight thinking, okay, I'm going to learn some methods of studying my Bible, like inductive Bible study and those kind of things, and we will get there. But tonight, we need to kind of lay the groundwork because all of those methods and all of those different ways of studying your Bible are useless if you don't get yourself right first. And so that's where we're going to go tonight. And uh, before we start, why don't we bow our heads in order to pray. Father, as we come before you this evening, God, we ask that you would make our hearts right to receive your word. Lord, that we would uh, purpose in our hearts to know you, to have a relationship with you, to see Jesus in every page of your word um, help us to understand it. Help us give us understanding, Lord. Uh, we know that that is one of the functions of the Holy Spirit to, to, as we read your word, give us the understanding and then later bring those things to our remembrance. And uh, so we thank you, Lord, for that. Uh, we also want to pray for Israel tonight as they are undergoing all of these attacks, Lord. Um, a, against a, a vicious Hamas that is just there to steal, kill, and destroy. And so give them victory and uh, help them through this tragedy. We thank you, God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, um, as we start, there's one thing I want to get out of the way really quick. And it's probably something that Pastor John would spend a long time on. But I just want to get through them and so that we can get on to what tonight's discussion is about. And that's our hearts. So, um, the Bible is a library that's filled with 66 books. Now, if there's any Catholics here, you might argue and say, Oh no, there's really 72. But 66 books are confirmed anointed and declared to be God's Word and contain sound and true doctrine. So our, our, our Bible, this Bible, has 66 books in it, and uh, we know that 27 of them come from the New Testament. And uh, these, this book has been written over a span of about 2,000 years. So the Bible was completed... Um, by 100 A.D., all of the books that are in your Bible were completed. And uh, if you go back 2,000 years, it was approximately 1900 B.C. Uh, when Moses started with the book of Genesis through the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, the Bible has about 40 authors. Uh, 35 of them are actually named in the book. Um, you will notice that uh, books like First Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, these are historical books in the Old Testament that were likely written by a council of people. In other words, they had more than one author. And uh, originally, uh, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and the New Testament contains Aramaic and Greek. Uh, the Bible has been translated into thousands of languages. It's currently be, being translated into more like, like very little known languages from tribes in, in the Amazon jungle and stuff like that. And so if there is any language out there that doesn't have a Bible translation, I guarantee you they are working on it currently. So um, many people have fought and died over this book, over its history. It's an important book, and uh, between the Old and the New Testament, we have the division of time from, from zero is the approximate birth of Jesus Christ. It's not exact. He was actually born a few years before 
the year zero, but um, basically our Lord Jesus Christ divided time, and this is a book about Him that was hidden in the Old Testament, and He is Jesus' revealed in the New Testament. Um, somebody has a question? Oh, okay. Um, so that's why Jesus says uh, in the Gospels, He said, these are written about me, referring to the Old Testament. But uh, God's Word and biblical doctrine is so deep and so rich that it goes beyond the ca capacity of our minds to truly fully understand it. So I'm going to help you and give you some methods and over the next four, over these four weeks, but uh, I'm glad that we cannot fully understand it. You know why? Because that means God is far more smarter than I am, right? <clears throat> that's the kind of God I want. One, that's, one that knows everything, not like me. I don't want a God that's made in my image. You know, that, because <laughs> uh, that would be a sinful God, I'll tell you that. But uh, things that go beyond our understanding, they tend to create division. And I kind of shared a little bit of, of this in the, at the men's retreat in our first study. But uh, when, when, you, when, when you have things that we don't understand, it creates sides. You have a one people on one side, you have people on the other. And uh, you end up with division in, in the church, in the body of Christ. But the more I study God's Word, and the more I grow in my understanding the more convinced that I become that what we don't understand, it's not about taking one side or taking the other side, but it's really about finding your balance. And uh, so we'll start with some basic concepts that we can all agree upon. Well, we should all agree upon. We don't all agree upon them, but these are basic things that we should all agree upon, and that is... Jesus Christ. Is He God or is He man? Right? And the answer is yes. He is 100% God and He is 100% man. But yet you have doctor, doctrines out there that suggest that He was only God and so now you, instead of a physical Jesus, you've created a spiritual Jesus and there are other people that say, no, he wasn't God. He was only man. And so then you deny the deity of Christ and you end up with a good teacher instead of a savior. And so we want to be balanced right down the middle and say that God is 100% God. Jesus is 100% God. And he's 100% man. And really... You may not completely understand that concept because it is a, it's, a, it's a difficult concept to understand how someone could be God and man at the same time. But you don't have to understand it to know that it's true, right? And so, not all truth is understandable to us. And if it was, then we would be equal to God, right? We would know everything. But we're not. And so this is a bit of, miss, of a mystery that we can't fully understand. Um, most of us, however, have a balance on the truthfulness of, of that, right? And so let's take another example. And I'll just list the book of Philippians. So was it written by Paul? Or was the book of Philippians written by God? The answer is again, yes. Yes. <laughs> Every word comes out of the heart of Paul, right? Every word is from the vocabulary of Paul. Every word expresses what Paul wanted to say, and yet every word is from the Holy Spirit. And so you have the same situation. The Bible is all of Paul, but every word is right from the mind of God. And so you have this balance right down the middle. If you believe that it's all Paul, then you don't believe that our Bible is the inspired Word of God, right? And uh, if you believe that it's none of Paul, then 
you will not be able to properly translate it when it comes time. We'll get into that in a little bit. But um, let's move this conversation to the direction of our salvation. When you were saved, was it God? Or was it you? <laughs> so, let's say it was all of God. Well, then, basically, you just one day said, well, here I am, God, I'm ready. You know? But that's not what happened. You had to turn from your sin. You had to acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord. And you had to place your faith in Him. And so... There are many calls in the Bible for the sinner to repent, to believe, and to commit himself to Christ. And so really, it was all of you. In other words, it was a total change of direction for you and for me as well to turn from sin to God through Christ. And yet, at the same time, it was really all of Him, right? Because... Nobody can come, for, come to the Father but through the Son, and nobody can come to the Son but that the Father draw Him. And so it's all of you, and it's all of God at the same time. It's that balance again. And so does everyone know what sanctification is? It means to grow in Christ, right? To grow in in your relationship, to grow in wisdom, to grow in knowledge, to grow in your character, to grow in integrity. All of these things come, to, come into play when it comes to spiritual growth or spiritual progress. And so you can ask the same question. Is it me or is it God? Is it an either or? Is it either God or me? Do we have to take one side or the other? What role does the believer play in his own growth? And what is God's role? What is the believer's role in sanctification? And what is God's role? Or to put it another way, is it me or is it him? Is it faith or is it my effort? Is it trust or is it obedience? And the answer to all of those is yes. yes. yes, yes, yes. And so... One of the questions that we want to answer for ourselves tonight is this. What is my role in understanding God's Word? And what is God's role in my understanding God's Word? And simply put, like Jesus, the answer is it's 100% you and it's also 100% God. And so... If we take a look at David in the book of Psalms, uh, particularly Psalm 119, he says this in verse, verses 15 and 16. He says, I will meditate on your precepts and I will fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. And so David talking about understanding and knowing God's Word, he says, I will. He says, my eyes on your ways, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your Word. And so in those two verses, it's pretty much all David, right? But then we get to verse 18, and he says, open, he's like praying to God, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. And so David recognized that he needed to put in the effort, but it was God that was going to give him the increase. Amen? Amen. All right. And uh, if we go to the New Testament, and I kind of shared this at the beginning in our prayer, but the Helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. But that doesn't, re that doesn't eliminate you from the responsibility, right? Because He says the Holy Spirit will... This is Jesus talking too, by the way. He says He will bring things to your remembrance. Well, you ain't going to remember it if you've never read it, right? And so we have a responsibility to understand and know God's Word. 
The Bible is God's inspired word to us. God has spoken in it, and He continues to speak through it. It's our authority for what we believe about God, and it is also the authority, the Bible is the authority on how we live our lives. And you've all heard this before. Bible, what does it mean? Basic instructions, Basic instructions before leaving earth. And if we don't get a proper understanding of God's Word, we, we, we may not understand where we're going when we leave earth. Amen? So we want to... Uh, um, the Bible teaches us how to worship God. The Bible teaches us how to love Jesus. The Bible teaches us how to love others. And depending on what your spiritual gifts are, it might teach you how to be hospitable. It might teach you how to lead well. It might teach you how to teach others well. Um, there are all things, all kinds of things stored up for us in God's Word that we can learn. And based on the fact that you're here tonight, leads me to believe that you love this book. Yes. And that you have a sense of your need to understand it better. And so... That's what we want to do. You know, if you, if you take a book of the Bible and let's say you read it once, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, you know, they've maybe read the New Testament once. And so if you read it once, you might pick up something, you might pick up a scripture here, you might pick up a scripture there, you might pick up a scripture over here, and really... When you connect the dots, you really don't know what you got, right? But the more you read and the more you understand God's Word, the more, it, the more dots you have to connect, right? And then when you really do get the understanding and you do connect all the dots, you will see that you have a picture. That's my own artwork, by the way. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of messed up over there, but otherwise, that's my artwork right there. Good <laughs> job. So, we don't want to see the Bible as being dead words on a page, right? If you see the Bible as dead words on a page, you're going to read it without joy. You're going to read it begrudgingly. You're going to pick up, oh, do I got to read this thing again? And so I'm going to show you a video. And the very beginning of the Bible is, is me reading when I don't feel inspired, when I'm not when I'm not loving my Lord and Savior, and, and when I'm not loving God's Word. And then, when you get that understanding, you'll see what happens. So we'll watch this. That's me when I don't. Now, is that not how you should react when you're reading God's Word and suddenly your eyes are like opened? Look at Rankin. I hope it's not going to make me watch the next video. And we'll just sit there for a second. All right. So, when God's Word comes alive to you, that's what, that's what we want it to look like, right? And as we begin this uh, endeavor to better understand and interpret God's Word, and as we read it, our first point tonight is that we want to start with... Let me go back. 
we want to start with the right goals. And so we need to ask ourselves this question. We need to ask ourselves the question, what are we trying to accomplish when we read the Bible? Does anyone want to answer that for me? Understanding. We want understanding, yes. Absolutely. Does anyone have any other goals when they pick up their Bible? They want to learn. Yeah, understanding, learn. Okay. Inspiration. You want inspiration? Okay. I want to know God's um, character, how He works. Very good. Very good answer. Very good answer. Wisdom. So, starting, what's that? Wisdom. Wisdom, yeah. Wisdom, understanding, learning, knowing the Lord. Understanding His ways is very important. So starting with the right goals is going to send us in the right direction, right? We are all different people. We all share a diversity of spiritual gifts, right? My gifts are different than Henry's gifts. My gifts are different than Leela's gifts. My gifts are different than my wife's gifts. Sean's, never mind. <laughs> Sean, Sean's gift of jokes are, are different than... <laughs> I was not born a comedian. <laughs> but you're learning. I, I'm learning. <laughs> so, even though we all have a diversity of gifts, even though we are all different people, God has called us into a unity together. Ephesians 4.13 says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so, when we read God's Word, we want to... That's one of the reasons why we study it together, right? We want to come to a unity in our faith and we want to have sound doctrine that we share together. Um, we don't want to sit under false teachers. We don't want to s sit under people that are going to lead us astray. But we want to all be headed in the same direction. And so all of these unique gifts in God, in God He works them all together for the benefit of the church. You know, I'm a pastor who is called to teach God's Word. And uh, I often study Scripture uh, with the question, because I'm over the men's ministry, I, I study it with the question, how, how will this Scripture speak to the men in the church, right? And there are children's teachers, there are youth pastors, they have different goals. The worship leader, when he reads Scripture, he may have his own goal in mind when he reads it. Uh, the evangelist might study God's Word in order to reach the lost more effectively. But ultimately, we need to be on the same page in order to work effectively together as a church, as a body of Christ. Um, and so, uh, you know, we may, we may read Scripture and come to wrong conclusions, or, or we may... Uh, <laughs> we may come to conclusions that might conflict with others. You know, I, I know the rich young ruler, when, uh, when Jesus tells him to, to, give, to sell everything and then give it all to the poor, you know, somebody could read that and say, well, you know what, I'm going to sell everything I have and I'm going to give it to the poor. Well, maybe you should talk to your wife first, don't you think, you know? <laughs> we, need to have, we need to have, we need to be moving in the same direction. And so, um, first of all, when it comes to right goals, our goal has to be rooted. Wait a minute. Our goal has to be rooted in the kind of book that the Bible is. And so here's what the Bible is it's a living word, it's communication from God to His people and also through His people. And so you have two sides to God's Word. You have a divine side, and you also have a human side of God's Word. And so we want to 
understand that this book is both human and divine, and we also know that when we read, we want to hear from God first. Most importantly, we want to hear from God because we are not information gatherers. I don't read the Bible just to gather information. I don't read the Bible as a historian trying to, trying to pick up historical facts. That's not my purpose for reading God's Word. We read God's Word because we are worshipers of God, right? And so we want to know what God's Word would say to us. But on, this, on the other hand, we also want to hear the message that the author is conveying. And so, like, uh, there's many epistles in the Bible that Paul wrote that are speaking correction to the church that he's writing to. You know, if you read, if you read the book of Galatians, he doesn't really start off with much of an introduction. He doesn't finish off with much of a, a so-and-so greets you and this person greets you. He just goes right into it and says, look, you guys, <laughs> you guys, how quickly you've fallen away from the truth. And, and he just like starts hammering them. Well, does that necessarily mean that when I read the Bible, you know, am I, am I someone who has quickly fallen away from the truth? Not necessarily. And so I have to understand the message that the author is conveying to the people that he wrote the Bible to. I have to understand that as well as understand that it is God's divine word and I want to hear from God. So we want to both hear from God and we want to understand the message of the human author. And so communication, it works this way. It starts with an author, and the communication is through the text, and the communication moves on to the reader. And so, where do we get meaning out of the Bible? Where does the meaning come from? You know, one person might say that, well, the meaning is simply in, in the text itself. You read the text, What's, what you get is what you read, nothing more than that. Um, other people, especially like liberal Christians, they read the Bible and they say, well, the meaning is entirely in the reader. And so what I get out of it might not necessarily be what you get out of it. You know, my truth is not necessarily your truth. And so you get all this weirdness, right? But... <clears throat> You know, whatever it is, God's, you know, if, if, if I read God's Word and I, say, and I start saying things, well, God spoke to me this way and things like that, well, those are kind of warning signs because, because you're, you've totally left out the human author and you've totally left out the text and you're just saying, well, God's Word is interpreted by me. I am the ultimate authority when I read God's Word. And that's not, that's not the truth. But the truth is this. You know, nobody likes it when someone else takes our words and twists them to suit their own meaning. You don't like it. I guarantee God doesn't appreciate it, right? So, we want to understand what the human author intended and we want to allow that to speak to us. And so the truth is, is it's not the text itself, it's not the reader that determines the truth, but it is the author that determines the meaning of the text. But the Bible is unique in that it has more than one author, right? And so there was the human author that we saw, and then there is also the other author. <coughs> I don't like to put Jesus' faces in pictures, so I found one where he's looking the other way. <laughs> something about not, not having an image or something like that. So I try to be faithful to that. And, but just so that you're fully aware, and just so that you don't walk away tonight saying, you know, Pastor Thomas didn't really teach me any kind of study method for understanding the Bible. We will get there. I said that at the beginning. I promise we'll get there. But we need to lay a little groundwork. And so we started with having the right goals. And now we are going to move on to 
actually, I'm not there yet. <laughs> we need to do this first. So, when I say that God spoke to me this way when I read the Bible, that is what's called eisegesis. I'm reading meaning into the text. What we want to do when we read the Bible is we want to be drawing meaning out of the text. Amen? We want to, uh, we want to understand what is given to us, what is there, not what, we, not what we read into it. And so there's many ways to misinterpret. Isn't it all a matter of interpretation? It's a matter of correct interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you look at, like, a lot of fighters will, will tattoo Philippians 4.13 on themselves and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And boom, I'm going to beat you up. Well, that's really, that's really, you're really kind of, kind of reading your own meaning into that scripture because you need the context of it. And Paul says, is whether he is abounding or whether he is abased, he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him because God is getting him through whatever trial he's facing. It's not a matter of beating somebody up because you're strong, because God has given you the strength to beat him up. That's a, that's a wrong interpretation. And so, yeah, it's, it is, it is. And so you want to only take what's in the text. You don't want to read into the text. And I know if you listen to, if you listen to enough preachers, you will hear them try to suggest what Paul's emotions were when he wrote this or, or yeah, and, and, or what Jesus was thinking when he said this. Well, Jesus really meant this, and but that's not what the Word says. If it's not in the text, then you shouldn't add it to the text. And so, so correct interpretation is based on what's actually there in the Word and also understanding what the author intended when he wrote it, which you can often figure out by, by what what people he's writing to, the historical context, um, the meaning of certain words, which we'll get to in a little bit. But don't read into God's Word. Draw out of God's Word. Only what's there. And so, this is the truth. is We don't want to bypass the human author in order to get to the divine author. And uh, to give you a little more understanding on that, Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Wait a minute. Oh, okay. We want to hear the message that the author is conveying. That's kind of what I just said. We don't want to bypass the human author to get to the divine author. Instead, we want to hear the message that the author is conveying. And if I read... Um, do I? Oh, there it is. There it is. So, we want to discern God's voice by discovering the author's intended meaning. And uh, now we get to 2 Timothy 2.7 that says, He says, Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. And so, first he tells Timothy to consider his words, and then he says to seek the Lord for the understanding. And that's really the, the, the way that we should approach Scripture is we want to listen to what the words say and then we want to ask the Lord to give us the understanding. Does that make sense? Yes. So, now we can get to the next part which is having the right heart. And it says character matters. Your character, when you read... God's Word might determine whether or not you receive the correct interpretation out of it. Where is your heart at, in other words? And so, um, this next takeaway says, who you are is just as important as how you study God's Word. Amen?
Okay, so I will use an example for this. Who you are is just as important as how you study God's Word. And so um, perhaps you've tried to uh, share what the Bible has to say with someone who is caught up in a cycle of addiction. Or perhaps you've tried to share the gospel with someone who's living in a homosexual lifestyle or some other relationship that is harmful, right? They may hear what you say, but because of the condition of their heart, it is unlikely that they will receive it. And so, you may or may not know, but you know, really the root of that is an of of an unwillingness to hear God's word is pride, right? People don't want to people don't want to be told that they're in the wrong, you know. People may understand that their addiction is wrong, but because of their pride, they will be unwilling to hear what you have to say. And so pride is a fatal flaw when it comes to absorbing God's word. And so our first uh, point when it comes to having a right heart is this. The key ingredient is humility. God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. And Psalm 25, 9 says this. He says, The humble He guides in justice, and the humble... <coughs> He teaches His way. So, less of you and more of God is going to equal a big God. Amen. And if you have a big God, if you see God as a big God who is a capable God, as a God who is worthy of all your worship, and then it will lead you to the next key ingredient, which is to have a readiness to obey what you read. You have to be ready to obey it when you read it in order to really understand it. Um, have you ever like read your Bible and, and you're, you're seeking the Lord in your reading, but you're really not he getting anything back at all? Like, it, like it's dry? It's probably that you are not ready to obey what you're reading, what, you're, what God is trying to tell you through His Word. You're not ready to obey it. And so it's very much like a, like a parent who knows when his child is not ready to listen, right? A parent knows when the child is not ready to listen. And so they're not going to, like, they may just like, time out, right? You're on time out. And so, but... If we're really seeking the Lord, if we're picking up God's Word, you know, it, it, it's a two-way form of communication, right? When I read God's Word, it's God speaking to me. And when I pray, it's me speaking to God. And so, any effective communication has to be two-way communication, right? And so, if I pick up my Bible, and I don't pray, it's kind of like God's speaking to me, but I'm not speaking back to Him, right? That's, that's not an effective form of communication. So, how should we respond when we are seeking the Lord, but He seems to be silent? How do we respond to that? Pray more, right? Keep praying. Pray more. And so, another key ingredient, now here's a Verse for you. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. And so here, uh, King David is demonstrating his readiness to obey by saying, I do not delay to keep your commandments. You give me your commandments, I want to respond to them immediately. <clears throat> and then... The next key ingredient is we want to have a readiness to pray. So, pray before you read God's Word. 
Pray after you read God's Word. If God is silent, pray some more. But you have to be ready to obey and you have to be ready to pray if you want to receive the understanding from God's Word. And so these are things that I think it's important for us to understand before we start working on individual methods. What do I need to pray for when I'm looking for understanding from God's Word? Well, David prayed for him to open his eyes, right? Open my eyes, Lord. And so we pray for wisdom. Um, James says that if anyone lacks wisdom, ask and God will give it to him liberally. So these are things that we can ask for when we are seeking more understanding from God's Word. And God is faithful. So you want wisdom, ask for it, and then pick up your Bible and read it. Colossians 4.2 says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And so, continue steadfastly in prayer. Thessalonians says, Pray without ceasing. And then, the next thing is this, and that is to be careful with your assumptions. What do I mean by that? Well, there's several things that I mean by that. Um, we can read God's Word, and each one of us has a different childhood, a different growing up, a different way of understanding words that we read. Words bring memories to our minds. And so if I read a word, it might have a different meaning than if Henry reads a word. And so as an example, um, they read uh, the, the, you know, the story of the prodigal son. Well, they read that to different, to different groups. And so um, there is one part of the prodigal son story where... Um, after the son goes off into a far country and wastes all the money, it says a famine came upon the land. And so they read that in the, they read the prodigal son in the United States, asked the kids to repeat it back to them. None of them said anything about a famine. But interestingly, when they go take that story to a poor country and read it to a group of poor kids, all of them no, re, uh, report, recite back that there was a famine in the land. So your upbringing determines the kind of assumptions you make about God's Word. And so we shouldn't assume that the word that we come across in the Bible has the same meaning or understanding that you grew up with. You know, every time we open God's Word, we're making assumptions in the Bible. Some assumptions will give you a good understanding, but bad assumptions will cause confusion. And they will cause an incorrect understanding of God's Word. And so, when you read your Bible, look for certain words that might cause you to have assumptions in your mind. Uh, for instance, uh, you read the word freedom in the Bible. Well, does it necessarily mean the same thing as what you understand it to mean. You read the word slavery. Well, that has bad connotations in, especially in our culture today, right? And so people read the word slave and they think bad things. But slave in the Bible has a different meaning. So, uh, marriage. Marriage in the Bible was far more had far more sanctity than marriage does today. And so people see the word marriage and they don't necessarily understand it. And things about your salvation, the word justification, the word sanctification. You know, ask yourself when you read these words, what do I believe about that word? And try to recognize those words in the Bible that are open to more than one interpretation and, uh, for instance, the word love. 
It's got several different meanings in the Bible. There's agape love, there's phileo love, brotherly love, there's eros. And so, which one is it? You can pick up a, a, uh, a concordance, you can go to Blue Letter Bible on your computer, and you can look up that word and it'll give you the definition which word it's talking about and the definition of it. And so, it's good if you're trying to gain understanding of your Bible, to have that concordance or that computer next to you so you can look up different words. It'll definitely help you. And so when you read your Bible, it begins with recognizing those words and then evaluating those words, how your assumption holds up with the context of the word. And then finally, Act on the results by submitting to the evidence that you discover. In other words, whether you discover that your assumption was correct or whether you discover your assumption was incorrect. If it was correct, then confirmation takes place. If it was incorrect, then allow correction to take place in your thinking. And so don't read the Bible stubbornly. So much of our false beliefs have the root cause of false assumptions when we read God's Word. And so, this is going to be our final takeaway for the evening, and it's this. Let Scripture tell you how it is, not the other way around. Okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about that uh, in the coming weeks. Um, but the truth is this, Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to work and to will for His good pleasure. And so, when we desire what God desires, then our will becomes His will. And then He is pleased with us. We don't want to be the kind of people that God uh, has to work in spite of us, right? We want God to work through us. We want to start with the right goals. We want to have hearts of humility. We want to have a readiness to obey God's Word. We want to have a readiness to pray at all times. And we want to have a desire to seek understanding from His Word and not our own human understanding, right? What does uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 say? Lean not on your own understanding. Trust the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. He shall direct your path. He shall direct your path. Very good. Amen. Shall we pray? Yep. All right. Father, we thank you for this evening. Lord, I pray that uh, as we go through the next three weeks, Lord, that you would uh, take this, uh, this right heart, that you would help us to have the right goals, and then as we look at the different methods for studying the Bible, God, would you fill our hearts and our minds with your knowledge so that we can all be unified in sound doctrine and the study of your word. Lord, we thank you. God, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So. Yes, next week we'll... We'll start on some technical details and eventually we'll get to like an inductive Bible study that we can, uh, that we can apply when we study God's Word. I know the women's Bible study uses it, but does everybody understand it? Well, we should, so we'll, we'll work on that. Anybody have any questions?